Welcome, everybody. Um, I'm uh, Tom Deval. I'm a senior fellow at Carnegie Europe, and it's my great honor and pleasure to welcome you to this live webinar uh, about Georgia and the EU. Um, we're borrowing the title from the Beatles, The Winding Road to EU uh, Membership. Um, so on, as I think all of you probably know, on November the 8th, the European Commission recommended that uh, Georgia be given candidate status of the European Union. It's a huge step forward. It puts them on the same level, Georgia on the same level as Ukraine and Moldova. But it's only one step, one move in a long and very complex story, which we'll discuss. And of course, it's not even guaranteed. It's hoped and anticipated that um, candidate status will be approved, probably in December, but that's not guaranteed either. So I'm very glad um, that we are joined by uh, Natalie Sabanadze, who's written a paper for us uh, as part of our Europe's East series, of which this is part of Carnegie Europe. Uh, the paper's title is EU-Georgia Relations, a local show of the global theater. Natalie, as many of you know, used to be um, Georgia's ambassador to the EU. She's now a senior fellow in the Russia-Eurasia program at Chatham House in London. In fact, two of us are actually in London and one in Tbilisi, none of us are actually in the EU today. I'm also very happy that we're joined by Corneli Kakachia. Corneli is another friend and he's the director of the GIP, Georgian Institute of Politics, and he's also Jean Monnet Chair at Tbilisi State University. So let's begin. Um, and um, we're going to try and be as interactive as possible and leave time uh, for questions. Natalie, tell me about your title, um, The Local Show of the Global Theatre. For you, this is about Georgia, but it's not just about Georgia. One of your themes is about how this is, Georgia is part of a trend, which is both in the EU and outside the EU, a trend of kind of countries staying as nominal democracies, but becoming increasingly illiberal and sort of lever leveraging what they can with the EU. Um, is this, um, so this for you is part of a larger picture, is that right? Uh, thank you, Tom. Uh, I am delighted to be here and uh, to share some thoughts with you uh, and Corneli. Um, and thanks for opening this uh, discussion with the uh, with this particular question because uh, really this is something that has been very much on my mind. Uh, obviously, I want to understand and as as much as possible explain what is going on in Georgia. Um, but I see that it is um, symptomatic of um, greater trends out there and underlying question that I had in my mind, and uh, it's not probably addressed in this uh, paper as such because the focus is on Georgia, but the underlying question really is how current global context is enabling democratic backsliding to a certain extent and enabling a kind of change of relationship um, between partners, uh, and the European Union, between the West and the rest, if you like, and where Georgia sits here in this configuration. Um, so part of the uh, picture that I describe is that in the recent years, and it, it is difficult to really pinpoint the beginning date, but you know, it's, it's a gradual process. Um, Georgia has been shifting away from some of its traditional core uh, foreign policy uh, priorities and also some of its core assumptions about where it stands uh, in the global context. What is it that will provide Georgia's security? How can it survive in this rough neighborhood? And how can it develop? What kind of state it wants to be? Our assumption basically from the beginning of independence has been that, yes, the neighborhood is rough, we could feel it straight away. Um, and 
Georgia's only way to progress and the only way actually to guarantee its independence and sovereignty is to move west, to basically um, join institutional west and in order to do this, to undergo transition, to accept some of the values, uh, democratization, etc. So this was seen not just value-based um, sort of decision, but it was very pragmatic and in the national security interests. So there was confidence. Um, and what is happening now, and you know, successive governments, we've had ups and downs, and uh, you know the story with our governments, but at least there's been this constant, this constant of Georgia trying to move sort of away, basically, almost from its geography, move out of the South Caucasus, join Eastern Europe, you know, become part of Moldova, Ukraine, trio, all sorts of um, policy initiatives that would push us closer to the EU. Um, and uh, that constant seems to be changing right now. And what is paradoxical in many ways is that we have been pushing for this for so long and the doors were closed. You know, there was a lot of discussion how European is Georgia, is it really a European country? When we were negotiating association agreement, you know, the best we could get was Eastern European country in the end, even though we wanted uh, a reference to a European state. Um, and uh, circumstances were not right. Uh, the political climate in the EU was not right, right, the same with the NATO. And all of this is changing uh, dramatically uh, and unexpectedly, right? Uh, and Georgia's position here is surprising. Instead of us sort of really jumping on this opportunity uh, and uh, seeing this as, uh, as, as a window that allows us to sort of pass through something that we have been waiting for 100 years, to be honest, not just uh, since the end of the Cold War, uh, our stance is very cautious. Um, and sort of we have a new message now to our partners in the West. We are telling them, OK, you want to reciprocate, right? Because, you know, um, previously our relationship could have been described as sort of having reciprocity deficit. We were asking, 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 and you know, mm -hmm. kind of a reluctant to reciprocate. And now this is changing. And we're telling them, OK, that's very good. We still want it. But we also have conditions now. You have to take us the way we are. Don't ask too much. Um, don't uh, give too many conditions. They're very good as we are, uh, and we have our dignity and we have our sovereignty, and we will come uh, in our own way. Sort of. This is the message that our government is um, conveying to the European partners. And what underlines this message? I mean, what gives them this legitimacy is basically saying an understanding that look, I mean. We are no different from others. And you have among yourself members of the uh, mm -hmm. And to be honest, there are also other alternatives. So now this brings me to this question of the enabling context. And um, I think there are several elements that I would like to outline. One is the perception. I don't know whether it's real or not. This is a highly debatable question, but the perception of Western decline. At least mm -hmm. the perception that the West and its model of liberal democracy is no longer unrivaled as it used to be before, right? As it used to be during the 90s, in the beginning of 2000s, and so on. All this time when Georgia was trying to become part of this community. There is also a sense that there are alternatives that are emerging. And these alternatives mm -hmm. are not so unattractive, um, mainly because you know, money can be made. Um, you can trade with various countries, you can trade with Russia, you can bring money, uh, construction projects, uh, infrastructure, yeah. development mm -hmm. with China, mm -hmm. you know, there are alternatives. Mm -hmm. And this can bring uh, prosperity, which means that the regime in power will have goods to distribute to the population and satisfy this requirement of development and prosperity. So I think this is very important. And in return, they're not asking for anything. Well, they're not asking you how democratic you're going to be. They're not asking you who you're going to put in jail. They, they don't care. Uh, so this is very 
uh, convenient. So this comes with no scrutiny of internal affairs, and it right. comes with the kind of uh, normative uh, underpinnings of you know sovereignty, non-interference. These are the norms that are foundational right. to international relations. So it's all very good. That is linked to the another symptom or another factor that I would like to talk about, and that is growing contestation of international norms. Right. Because there seems to be all of these countries, all of these regimes, the non-democratic dictatorships, hybrids, uh, uh, democracies, they mm -hmm. all agree that there are certain norms and they all say that they are democratic. They all say that they respect sovereignty, the sovereign mm -hmm. choice, um, uh, inter equality uh, mm -hmm. among states, um, and so on mm -hmm. and so forth. In Russia, listen to Putin. I mean, his whole discourse, every time it's becoming more and more developed, is all about reiteration of international norms. But he has very peculiar interpretation of this, right? So there is this growing contestation of the how you interpret these norms. And also a kind of rebalancing. While before, um, with the uncontested Western dominance, so to say, mm. the, the, the focus was on uh, governance, on human rights, on uh, re sovereignty as responsibility, right, rather than sovereignty as an absolute right. Now the rebalancing is going back to sovereignty as right and uh, non-interference in international, in, in right. internal affairs. These are also norms, right? They're also important. But this is where so, we're moving. Let me just jump in a little, uh, yeah. Natalie, because this is great. But I also want us to, to drag us a little back to the EU, um, and I'm sure we'll have time for, for more. Just before I turn to Corneli, just I'd be interested in your comment on how the EU has responded to this challenge, mm -hmm. because obviously it's it's a broader challenge. It's trying to continue to use enlargement as a normative tool, but in a much more contested environment um and yeah. obviously this wouldn't have happened as we know without what's on russia's aggression against ukraine so do you think the eu has handled it as well as it could do you think the decision made on november the 8th uh, was a good one um and you know so just a, a few comments yeah. on how the eu is so, handling this going forward and then and then we'll turn to Cornelia. yeah so everything yeah. that i've been describing um is the context which makes this particular enlargement for the EU particularly difficult. This is going to be a tough round of enlargement, right, if, if it is to uh, proceed. So I think the EU is aware of it, but I'm not quite sure that it is determined to make it a success. Um, this enlargement is taking place in the context of not only geopolitical, but also ideological uh, competition. So there is a real risk of losing out. So the EU needs to be determined to win it. And to use this um, incredible advantage, political and geopolitical advantage that it has, which is the fact that countries still are queuing up to become members, right? And enlargement is a unique instrument. Nobody else has it. There is no other expanding polity where people want to join in on their own will. Okay, so uh, it is. It was a logical kind of reaction of the EU uh, to the Russian aggression to reawaken and use that instrument that they have. So now the the question is how to bring it to an end, and how to combine the the normative requirements, the respect for criteria with the geopolitical needs. Um, and it is a bit too early to assess because the EU is also in the process of doing it and learning. Um, I think the 8th of November decision was a good decision. Um, I'm saying it as a Georgian, but also as somebody who um, who is a great champion of the European Union. And I think it was a good decision because also, it was framed in the right way. It was a decision that said, "Okay, we. This was this was not an, a, um, a kind of an, uh, a present for the future, but rather a response to the past." I felt that this was a response to all these years 
when Georgia was very loyal and was uh, active and requesting um, advancement, it was kind of a belated uh, response to that. Um, and it was framed as such, it was said, and it was also said that more needs to be done. Now, I think when it comes to the next stage, uh, if we get there and when we get there, this transition is going to be much more difficult because there, I think it will be very important that there are some concrete deliverables and that Georgia progresses. And that is very much in EU's geopolitical interest. So basically, EU has to learn how to tie conditionality with its geopolitical interests better and be honest about it. Um, and, uh, you know, we can discuss more um, what else can, can can change. But I think, you know, this additional two um, uh, priorities that have been identified after 8th of November, in a way, is a step in that direction because it talks about combating disinformation, which is a, a hybrid threat, not only to Georgia, but to the EU. And it also talks about alignment in the foreign policy, which is also a, a, a message saying, well, if you have to be part of us. And, and we, we kind of expect a degree of loyalty and looking at things in the same way. Great, thank you. Um, and um, thank you, Natalie. I'm going to turn to Corneli, but um, just a reminder that we are taking questions. Um, and if you're watching this um, live, please do submit your questions and I'll put them to our speakers. Um, Corneli, you're sitting in, in Tbilisi. Give us any reaction um, that you like to what Natalie has told us. And also, obviously, we're interested in how um, the November 8th decision has gone down um, in Tbilisi. Both, um, obviously, the government was happy, but it seems that wider society uh, was happy as well. Yes, thank you, Tom, uh, for this opportunity. Uh, yes, I think I mostly uh, agree with Natalie, basically, what she said, and I subscribe fully uh, her analysis about the Georgian situation. But uh, also what I would like to add that uh, of course, uh, this was a very strong signal to Georgian people uh, because, you know, as you know, Georgia was striving last decades to get this uh, European aspiration. And as it was mentioned earlier, there was no reciprocity from the EU side that time because of geopolitics, because of, um, you know, local politics. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, this uh, decision was very important. It was kind of like small light in the, in the dark tunnel, uh, because as you know, the Georgia is not a member of any uh, relevant security organization. We are not member of any post-Soviet, uh, you know, CIS, CSTO, anything. And Georgia has actually for decades now the security dilemma. And uh, uh, of course, uh, EU uh, candidate status is not solving our security problem, but at least uh, Georgian society and Georgian people at least will know where to navigate, and this will be some sort of geopolitical compass where they sh uh, where should they should be moving. And I think that was very important. And I, I think uh, and it was very important also that you got it right, even though they may not be happy about the present Georgian government and the, the, their behavior, but. Uh, of course, there, they, there was an understanding in Brussels that they don't want to punish Georgian people because of the government. And I think that was very important. That of course, the geopolitics still was a kind of main reason there. But of course, I agree with Natalie that we should not expect any shortcuts after this. Uh, because And I think that you should really use this very strong conditionality because, uh, of course, uh, giving candidate status, uh, we should not be very naive and uh, just to understand that now the Georgian government becomes uh, very liberal and they will, uh, you know, like uh, enrolled in, you uh, know, sweeping reforms or something like this. I don't think that will happen, especially we should consider that next year is election year and that's a very crucial year for Georgia and Georgia entering basically very turbulent period. And uh, I think um, this is a, some sort of, um, um, I would say, crossroad uh, where, uh, and it, I know that every 10 years in we Georgians, we love to talk about this crossroad, you know, like, but I think this is now the second or third time we have this crossroad when we have to actually prove that uh, if we want to, uh, to transform the country and if we don't want the stagnation where we are, then we have to uh, change something in the next year in many ways. And another thing I also, which I also wanted to talk uh, is that um, referring this is foreign policy changes is that uh, there used to be, uh, probably most of us remember that 
for many years, uh, I would say, uh, for Georgian, uh, role model was Baltic states, Lithuania, Estonia, these post-Soviet countries who were, uh, you know, kind of um, uh, who managed actually to escape it from uh, former Soviet space, and they became member of EU and the uh, and the NATO. But I'm not sure that uh, holds anymore. I, I think now uh, Georgia is moving absolutely to different uh, kind of, you know, like uh, um, uh, I would say position and which is very ambiguous. Uh, it's also alienates our strategic partners. It also gives us some sort of um, impression to Russia that they have some sort of uh, uh, informal power on the Georgian foreign policy. And uh, of, of course, at the end of the day, um, uh, this also creates uh, some sort of ambiguity about Georgia. And that's why we have a lot of questions uh, recently where Georgia actually is heading. Uh, of course, we, uh, everybody understands that what Georgian people want, but uh, there's a question about what the Georgian government wants. Uh, and I think uh, that here is some uh, very interesting observation uh, which I had that uh, I think that government, which is becomes more and more authoritarian, um, they also using some mistakes from the West. And I would refer several of that, which is um, which also resonates in the society. And we should be open, um, we should open up about We should openly talk about this, that, for instance, what during the last decades, um, there was a lot of help, a billion of dollars and euros uh, uh, for Georgia and any other uh, EAP countries. But what West could not actually uh, deliver and it would not help is that there was no actually strategic planning how to help Georgia economically, how to uh, help the, to revive the economy, how to, uh, I know that there was a lot of program from EU, from other side, but I think uh, there was no really some sort of kind of Marshall plan, how to work on Georgia, Ukraine, some other countries in order to uh, that ordinary Georgian should think that yes, this was, this is a real transformation. We see that things are changing for ordinary Georgians. And I think, this is what uh, the government and also some Russian, you know, political force is using. And I think uh, this is where uh, kind of West failed. And then second thing, which of course is more obvious that uh, West could not provide for last decade the security guarantees. Of course, there are some uh, objective reasons there. Um, it's not only Georgia, but there are some other issues related to NATO membership and other things. And I think this also uh, resonated to Georgian public because there was some sort of... Uh, a little bit uh, net of fatigue and some other things because you know like georgia as you know um, uh, you know paid a lot uh, especially after 2008 invasion of russia and uh, i think that uh, of course some people in the west they think that this is uh, georgia's pro western policies uh, like taken as a granted but this is not like this because uh, and georgians also were very active in different nato missions and there was an expectation, and not from political class, but from society, that this would pay off at some point. And Georgia will get at least some sort of security guarantee. And that was not really provided. And I think this also um, you know, feeds this homegrown, uh, I don't know, uh, Euroscepticism or whatever you call this far right movement or whatever. And I think this government is using this quite well. And to say, frankly, they are very good in polling. Uh, they do their own polling and they know what uh, what are the moods in different parts of society and of course they uh, based on this they also coming with this uh, kind of you know some very strange state statements uh, against the western officials or uh, sometimes which echoes to the uh, you know statements from moscow which makes georgia's situation is um, uh, even more uh, kind of ambiguous and i think this puts georgia really in vulnerable situation especially now uh, because I think this decision uh, in the middle of December will will be very important uh, for for Georgia. Of course, as I said, uh, and just to conclude, uh, it will not the candidate status will will not solve the uh, problems. Uh, and we know that there are some other countries, like for instance Turkey and some others, who are can, who have this candidate status for decades. But uh, but the thing is, what, uh, we should ask as a Georgian citizens what what is important for us: the just candidate status or real transformation of the country. What is the, our aim? Uh, to uh, build a real democratic country uh, or we just uh, want to be, um, for us, this kind, kind of more important to have this materialistic view uh, about EU integration or uh, are we trying to embrace this value-based uh, approach towards EU? I think these are the open questions we still, uh, which still, we still need to be, uh, to be answered by Georgians and Georgian political class as well.
Great. Um, thank you so much, Corneli. Um, I'm glad to say some questions have been arriving. Uh, one of them is, the first one is, is Georgia's membership in the EU, well, not membership, I guess, candidate status, or maybe maybe membership, is widely accepted as a stabilizing event or a destabilizing event? Maybe that's, um, I don't know whether the question means vis-a-vis -vis Russia or vis-a-vis -vis internal politics. Let's just take a look at the, the, the uh, another couple. Uh, people are asking, um, and I think this is very much part of your paper, Natalie, about how this affects the um, coming uh, next year's parliamentary elections. We expect them to be held next October. Um, and uh, I've also just revisiting your paper, you have some recommendations that um, you know, one year till the elections, um, that this is that nowadays it's not just about election day it's about the whole democratic culture it's about the run-up to elections and um let me just read a, a few lines from your paper a box ticking approach to the reforms required for eu accession has not always produced sustainable results more promising would be a serious effort by the eu at fostering societal buy-in for democratic transformation before pro-european public attitudes prevail and then you have some um, comments about the election um, need for a fully proportional system. Uh, the EU should redouble its EU should redouble its scrutiny of this election by focusing not on short-term administrative aspects, but on long-term observation of structural political inequalities, flagging unfair advantages and aiming to level the playing field for meaningful electoral competition. Um, I think these are great recommendations um i guess i guess the question anyone in brussels w watching this would be asking is um how can we do this when we're getting so much pushback um from the government but um your comments um so let's start with natalie on, on this thanks tom um of course this is <laughs> most difficult when you come to kind of concrete um suggestions what specifically and concretely can the EU do? And I have to say, we should not exaggerate um, the EU's capacities at the moment as well. You know, we, there, it's unfair to expect that here comes EU with its magic wand of conditionality and everything is going to change. So uh, a, a degree of humility, uh, the EU should engage understanding its limits. And I think this is an important starting point for the EU to know where the limits are and where are, uh, conversely, where are the advantages? Like who are there among the Georgian uh, society who can be the enablers of reform? Because there are many and the, the society remains very pro-European and, and pro-Western. And as Corneli said, fundamental is uh, to kind of uh, discuss uh, not EU membership as membership in the club that brings security, prosperity, etc. That That is, uh, you know, this is something that follows afterwards. But the most important thing is EU membership as a road to Georgia's transformation and consolidation as a European style institutional democracy. This is where the value of the EU and the whole process of um, accession lies, right? Um, so I have often thought, like, what are the reasons why we can't sort of get out of this? And some are circumstantial, I suppose, you know, the people who are in power, and some are structural. And this is where I think the EU has to look at the structures. That, um, that are out there that are very difficult to deal with. And first thing is to understand that, you know, this is no longer transition uh, economies and these are no longer transition democracies that are trying to move from communist regime to something else. These are well-established hybrids and that's a new norm. These are well-established hybrids who've le learned how to dodge the rules, how to uh, be part of the uh, establishment, uh, uh, sit at the table, receive assistance, and who are very good at box ticking. And this is what our government does super well. You know, they will do enough to give uh, uh, ground uh, to say, okay, let's move forward. Uh, and this is a very well 
established pattern. Another part of it is that for these hybrids, the most important thing is stability, and they say it, uh, and prosperity in terms of the priority list. And stability means also stability of the regime, which in turn means staying in power constantly, right? Through democratic means, through elections that are not necessarily stolen on that day, which is so obvious that everybody's going to uh, be up in arms, but gradually, you know, through years of creating incentives, uh, pressure on, on the civil service, and basically destroying the playing field where normal democratic contestation is simply not possible. And today what is happening in Georgia, that has always been the case, right? We've gone through these periods. But what is unique today is that you have party in power, which is very consolidated, which has pretty much the um, dismantled independent institutions, uh, which is, you know, uh, self-assured in its hybridity. Uh, as a liberal regime, um, which uses ideology, the kind of nationalist ideology, populism, to um, as an electoral resource. Um, but um, most importantly, um, they control state resources, and there is also the same power controls incredible uh, for Georgia private resources. So the combination of this makes it very difficult to change. Now, these are uh, first proportional elections. I hope that there will be no change in that. So these are actually really structural, slight, slight structural change, which should uh, enable uh, uh, a, a better contestation. It should give chance for dismantling the majoritarian rule that has been very characteristic of Georgia, which has basically always led to the authoritarian uh, excesses. It was, it's democratic. It's, it's one party takes all majoritarianism, but it ends up where we are now consistently. We go through this cycle. So structurally, also looking for the, from the point of view of the, of the EU, you know, let's look at power sharing. Let's look at European style of democracy. I know there are no, like, there are all sorts of different models. So it's very difficult for the EU to choose and advocate for one, but that can be very context specific. Georgia needs to be encouraged to learn and to accept power sharing. I would like to see political parties campaigning who would tell me, I want to win these elections and then I'm happy to lose them and go to the opposition and come back. There is nobody, I think, definitely no political power that has been uh, in Georgia governing power ever considered the possibility of actually losing elections and becoming an opposition and also serving the country uh, right. from its opposition. So these are really uh, fundamental uh, issues. And to be honest, these general conditions, um, they go in that direction, but they're not specific enough. By the way, that uh, April 19th agreement that Charles Michel tried to broker, it was much more specific and it did go into the power sharing uh, direction. I think it, it, it's a shame that this agreement was abandoned by the rest of the EU. It could have been actually translated into conditionality, which would have been quite specific to the Georgian context. Great. Thank you. Uh, Corneli, um, over to you, some reactions. Yeah, basically, I will try to answer several uh, few other questions there. Um, one of the questions is basically what you can do in order to uh, make um, Georgian dream uh, to change, um, you know, like environment before the election. I think uh, there's not really much uh, to be done because it's not about the what you can do or uh, you know wants to do uh, but i think one of the issue which we I, I think was highlighted one of the our publication in carnegie europe is that related about uh, the regime survival and uh, this is the major problem uh, which is the uh, which is a very important for georgian dream and also oligarch who is uh, behind of uh, this uh, political team that uh, basically they see uh, next election as kind of zero sum game and if if there will be regime change and if they lose this government this uh, you know power then according to this unwritten rule of georgian politics they, sh they should uh, expect some sort of vendettas 
And if you, if you look at our traditions and just look, you know, how they're dealing with Mikhail Saakashvili and what was previously, you know, the previous the government were doing, uh, the previous government, right? I, I don't think that, uh, you know, they should expect something different. And of course, this puts um, uh, the leaders of Georgian Dream, uh, the people who are in the government now, um, uh, they, uh, the, the leverage of EU or United States or other strategic partners now getting uh, less important because these people just now thinking about how to survive. It, sometimes it's a physical, sometimes, you know, it can be uh, about their capital, sometimes it's political survival, whatever you can call it. But basically this regime survival instinct is much more important than, uh, for instance, what EU or United States uh, will do. And that's the, the this is also, the, the, that's also explanations uh, of the Georgian foreign policy orientation, recent ones, especially uh, this uh, very strange uh, kind of agreement with China, where we assign some sort of strategic agreement with China, whatever that means, uh, you know, like there's many questions about how this answers Georgian national uh, interest and many other questions there. But uh, it's it's not the main point. Main point is not about the middle corridor. Of course, this is important for Georgia, the connectivity and uh, others. And I think everybody understands that. But uh, the main thing which Georgian uh, Dream uh, wants to convey to the West is that a uh, message is clear that if you will um, uh, press us too much and if you try to leverage us too much and you, inter whatever they call this interference in the sovereign uh, country, then we have some other alternatives. Of course, now they cannot say directly, you know, Russia is there, that, that will, uh, they cannot sell this, but, uh, you know, there's some other li liberal powers like China. Uh, and if you look at the Georgia surrounding, we are basically a country which is also itself a hybrid regime, is surrounded by illiberal powers. And uh, of course, uh, the message is very clear. And also EU and the United States also understood this. And uh, that's why I think that, uh, and uh, uh, also I want to uh, link this with my previous statement where I was uh, talking about the failure of the West last decades uh, to do something as, uh, to change this Georgian, um, you know, like economic situation. And I think here the, uh, uh, the ruling party is trying to bring China as a kind of, uh, 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 you know, like a country who can actually bring and elevate uh, the Georgian social political life. And I think uh, in general, you know, like um, uh, many Georgians, we don't know the, uh, much about China. Of course, the political class and especially the ruling party wants to sell China as a kind of savior, uh, savior of Georgia, you know, who will help the Georgia to modernize the economy and some other things. But thing is that, uh, we don't know another part of China, which is more controversial about, for instance, what is the China's foreign policy uh, in Asia, African countries, and some other things. I think these are the uh, these are the questions which need to be discussed. And but what we see, things are not really transparent in terms of foreign policy. For instance, you know who knew. Um, the Georgian government was uh, uh, trying to sign the strategic agreement about China. There was no discussion, neither parliament, neither uh, there was uh, on the media or something. So who is making this kind of decision, strategic decision? Is it like small uh, team uh, in the executive branch or there's uh, some other people? Uh, there's still a lot of questions and we don't have these answers. And of course, uh, this puts, uh, you know, a lot of, uh, uh, you know, like um, questions about what you or the United States specifically can do about this. And I think uh, main thing here is that, uh, of course, uh, you in the United States, they have a leverage, but uh, at the same time, uh, as Natalie mentioned, uh, there should be some realization what can be um, objectively uh, done and what are the issues uh, uh, which they cannot press. And I think uh, what I see now, in, 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 especially in diplomatic corps in Georgia, there's a realization that uh, they they cannot push too much uh, and not to push also Georgia towards Russia or to other illiberal powers. And I, I think this uh, regime is using it quite well. Uh, and uh, basically, uh, main message also from the regime is that if you don't interfere and in, uh, in our uh, elections, especially, and if you will not question the legitimacy of this election, we will uh, do some sort of, uh, you know, w w w some sort of part of this reform, whatever you can say. But if you uh, if you will uh, support the civil society, which is seen pretty much like challenger for this uh, regime, because they unfortunately quite successfully so far managed uh, to marginalize political opposition. And uh, uh, if you provide it, there, there will be uh, will not be some sort of uh, uh, there will be some sort of security guarantees that there will be no regime change. Then 
maybe you or some other international actors can uh, um, uh, can uh, um, you know pressure a little bit more but of course nobody in the west can give you this kind of guarantees uh, neither to georgian dream neither the oligarch and i think th these are the um, these are the problems which is still uh, still a kind of very important for the country so you're not detecting corneli any willingness um on the coming elections to you know to meet what the eu is is talking about a, a, a more transparent process rather the opposite from the sound of it uh, yes again uh, it, it's not about the um, it's not about political will of course we we see that georgian government doesn't have the political will and one of the reason why they don't have this political will uh, this this was uh, this is what i was trying to explain because it's they see it again again from this survival uh, you know point of view and that's why uh, they will do some uh, some of this reform probably this nine uh, recommendation which is still left but if it's uh, embol uh, if it endangers uh, uh, kind of like uh, regime security of course they will, they are not going to do this and this is the this is the same problem for opposition because uh, um, that that was kind of dilemma for uh, some part of the opposition because they were thinking that if georgia will not get candidate status uh, or if georgia will get some of this emboldens the authoritarian regime which is you know quite fair uh, you know argument but at the same time if georgia will not get candidate status i don't think this will be uh, better for georgia or for eu because uh, that could uh, uh, you know, push country even for more isolation, and which uh, and I, I don't think this is also interest um, of the European Union to see more isolated Georgia. The more isolated Georgia will be, it will be much closer to Russia, to China, and some other illiberal powers. Right. Yeah. Well, that's quite a sobering uh, analysis there. Um, the, we're getting um, several questions. I think. I think we've tackled um several of them but um the, the the last question i'm reading reads what do you ex what do you expect from the december verdict do you think this has potential to challenge georgia's current foreign policy re-russia and also azerbaijan i guess i guess the implication there is that if there's a positive verdict it it does strengthen to some degree, Georgians, uh, Georgia's EU vector. Um, Natalie, do you want to take that one or any other questions that you're seeing as well? Um, yes, I could try to take it. Um, expectations from December verdict. I mean, ideally, uh, the expectation is that the council will endorse commission's recommendations. But, uh, well, there are different rumors now uh, at play. Uh, there is a bilateral issue between Hungary and Ukraine, and maybe this will um, actually the decision uh, will not be as expected, and maybe it will be derailed. And then how will it affect others? I would expect that if there is no decision on Ukraine, it would also negatively affect um, us. Um, which would be um, unfortunate. But how can this decision uh, impact Georgia's foreign policy? Mm, not very much, I think. Um, I think this is something that um, Georgian Dream wanted for domestic reasons, for domestic political reasons, because, you know, still by all polls, we know that Georgia is very pro-European, so this helps, it's an electoral resource. But in terms of foreign policy, I think uh, the government will continue the kind of, uh, well, we can call it multi-vectoring of Georgia's foreign policy, what Corneli was describing, because this kind of foreign policy suits better the needs of this type of regime. It's like an insurance policy. If you don't give me your grant, I can go and get it from somewhere else. And that somewhere else is not going to ask me too many uncomfortable questions. Um, I would like to build alternatives so that I can use it also as a bargaining chip if necessary. So this is kind of strengthening the bargaining power and position of uh, the country vis-a-vis -vis EU. So this is another change as well that I was trying to refer to that EU needs to take into account that not only the circumstances have changed, but the candidates are different too. And their, um, uh, their abilities 
to survive in the gray zone have been well tested. So they, they're going to be able to, to push back on, on many things. So I think this will continue. Um, I, I disagree with uh, Cornelie, just for the sake of it. Uh, not that we don't know about China. I think we do. I mean, most people read news. We know China is not a democracy. We know China is a rival to the West. Um, the difference is that China doesn't come with the same historic and political baggage as Russia does. So for this regime, China is a safer bet. Because Russia, you know, it creates a lot of a reaction. But here it's safer and it, it serves well this whole prosperity modernization agenda that comes with, uh, with this and say, well, that we need to develop it. It's our interest. It's, uh, again, money can be made. You know, you can all live better. And ultimately what they're saying is that you can live better and make money without necessarily doing all these things that the West asks you. Um, so I think this approach is something that this government or whoever directs them is looking at the world and seeing an opportunity there. And I see that this will continue. So that is... Uh, that is a challenge. And we'll have to see what happens at the next stage. I mean, I think the domestic and foreign are very much intertwined. Uh, and for the next stage, uh, th there will have to be some reforms delivered. And of course, what, as Corneli said, we, can't, we can only expect facade reforms because to, to, for the government to do all the nine recommendations in good faith, it's like the same as self-destruct, basically, then they're no longer a hybrid regime, then they're more or less okay democratic regime, particularly when it comes to judiciary, right? So that's um, hard to expect. Again, that makes the elections particularly important because we need to move uh, out of this and, and, and have the power, the, 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 uh, whoever, the coalition, whoever is going to be, who will have other motives than just staying in power. So let's thank you for that. Let's just look forward a bit. Um, um, let's presume for the sake of argument uh, that the Hungary issue is navigated, that uh, Georgia gets candidate status. Let's also presume for the sake of argument that because it's the favourite, Georgian Dream wins the next election with a majority. We know the opposition is quite weak and it's in a very advantageous position. Given both of those things, is Georgia then going to be stuck for a long time in this hybrid model with in a kind of like Turkey, which also is also a hybrid authoritarian state with EU candidate status? Or is or does Georgian society, the pro-European part of Georgian society, have the resources to change things, to 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 kind of um, push Georgia out of that waiting room into a more, you know, genuine European contender. We'll just, just talk us through what happens, you know, in probably one year's time if both of those things happen. I don't know which of you wants to comment on that. Okay, maybe I'll, I'll start. Um, uh, I think um, this is kind of negative scenario for Georgia. I hope, uh, but if this will happen, and I hope this will not happen, but. Uh, um, if that's the case, uh, I think um, uh, it will be very difficult because what we will see is there probably more consolidation of the authoritarianism uh, because, uh, you know, when the GD already feels that they don't have a challenger and uh, plus uh, they don't feel that any accountability because they actually uh, don't have uh, this sense of accountability anymore and uh, they're just accountable to one person uh, and everybody knows who is this person and i think this uh, puts georgia a little bit uh, closer now not to ukraine in the moldova but to other uh, our neighbors and i think this is a um, this is a quite uh, very negative scenario for georgia because we already have reputational damage with our partners and i think what Georgia needs now, it, it needs uh, to change its um, uh, very shaken uh, image because, uh, um, you know, you, Tom, remember that uh, for decades Georgia was a front runner in EAP 
among the EIP countries. And uh, Georgia was uh, getting so much support from EU and from other international uh, you know, actors that not because we had uh, very wise presidents or you know leaders or something, but because Georgia was always seen kind of permanent laboratory of change. And uh, there was a you know, permanent uh, attempt to reform the country, sometimes successfully, sometimes unsuccessfully. But that was still, uh, you know, like uh, seen as a, you know, like a cause that country wants to, uh, um, you know, change. And I think we lost that kind of image. And I think this is a problem. And what what Georgia and what Georgian citizens need to realize that. We uh, we are not Azerbaijan. We don't have gas or uh, oil. We don't have a very influential diaspora like Armenians or other. So we have only this intellectual capacity and this kind of uh, this uh, uh, kind of uh, support for freedom and democracy. And if we lose this uh, very, I would what I think personally very Georgian quality, then I don't think that Georgia will be uh, kind of different from other uh, our other illiberal uh, neighbors. So I, having said that. I think uh, I still hope that um, even even though it, there can be this kind of negative scenario, where I'm a little bit more positive, I see some changes among the young uh, people, especially what I call this uh, Erasmus generation of Georgians who are really truly European. And uh, this, we saw these people, you know, hundreds of thousands of people in the streets. And I think uh, one thing about Georgia, unlike to other neighbors, is that I think last certain years nobody could manage to consolidate, uh, you know, like uh, authoritarians in Georgia. And uh, yes, of course, you may not have this exactly how this is going to change or whatever. But sometimes Georgian uh, politics, for good or bad, is very unpredictable. The things which uh, you may see that they they may not be breakthrough uh, because of small mistakes of the regime or because of some changes geopolitics or something. You know, there can be some sort of momentum and which can change. Uh, uh, paradigm inside the Georgian politics. So that's why I would not be so much, um, you know, like, uh, um, uh, you know, like, uh, I'll be more optimistic. Of course, I, I, if, if somebody asks me, what is your ground of this optimist? I, I cannot, I don't have this evidence, but what I have is, I have this feeling and uh, based on uh, our experience last 30 years that in very uh, important moment, Georgian public is able, unlike our maybe other neighbors, to able to take initiative and to change country for the better. And I hope this will be probably the case. We don't know when and how. I hope this will be done through election. And I think this is very important because what Georgia now needs is a change of the government or transformation of the country through election and not through kind of like a revolutionary or some other kind of scenarios. Thank you, yes. Um... Natalie, the same question to you, but maybe with a kind of EU twist to it. What tools does the EU have if Georgia gets continues to be stuck in this kind of hybrid authoritarian model? And what um, you know, there, there, there's obviously wow. candidate status is just one part of a long process. Um, you know, there's supposed to be talks, accession talks. Maybe if Georgia's see that. Um, they're falling behind Ukraine and Moldova. Is that a tool that the EU uh, can use? Just some, some comments from you on that. Yeah. Um, so I understand the um, spirit of your question, the initial one. You know, if, if it's stuck and if nothing's happening, so is it going to be another revolutionary change, basically, in, in Georgia? Because, you know, you, you, you can't do otherwise. Um, I think uh, winning proportional elections with full majority is very difficult. Yeah. Uh, and winning this fourth time while being in the government, even if you are angelic and you've done everything, you know, people just get sick of you. So that is uh, another uh, difficulty. So I think to achieve that, uh, they will have to do some serious uh, rigging. Uh, and it doesn't have to be, you know, very obvious rigging, but, you know, long term, uh, as we say, if the result is achieved, there will be a lot of frustration, I think, in among the public. Uh, and Georgia probably will be stuck as a uh, as a hybrid. And the difficulty of confronting hybrid regimes is that they are gradual and they're not so obvious. You know, they dismantle institutions. They 
do the backtracking slowly. So what the EU also needs to do here is understand this anatomy of hybrid regimes and sharpen its tools. I don't think they have it to sharpen the tools to respond to this. So elections is one, I mean, this is a real opportunity because these are proportional elections. So EU, to be honest, should already now be thinking about observation and should be and they've put it in their conditions, right? They've said these elections need to be conducted properly <laughs> to, to uh, translate it. So they should already be thinking about election observation, which would give, uh, it doesn't have to be 100 observers sitting in Tbilisi for a year. That can be done also um, from far away. But every time there is a decision, a democratic decision taken by government or by using supermajority that further tilts the playing field, this is a warning sign. So you can have some kind of warning indicators and then you say you react straight away, not leave it until the next assessment. Okay, so you react straight away and then these reactions accumulate uh, and it creates already a picture. The OSC or DEER observation can be supplemented by a very strong EU observation, even though it hasn't necessarily been the EU's kind of uh, modus operandi, this is exceptional situation and things are changing. So I think that uh, can happen uh, and should happen. And again, the conclusions should be a little bit more straightforward. Okay, this is also about the voice of international community. And Corneli was saying, like, you know, there is a reluctance to push the government, you know, as if, like, you know, th this way we're going to uh, lose Georgia even more. Uh, if you if you give legitimacy to this kind of uh, democratic backsliding by being quiet or by being uh, balanced, so to say, uh, the outcome is worse. For me, as for the Georgian citizen, I, uh, this means that I have basically no allies from the West to push for the change. But... Um, there is always one possibility, which is of a big mistake, a big obvious mistake, like foreign agents law was, that kind of brought a lot of people out. Uh, and uh, the government clearly miscalculated. They thought, oh, we've done so much discrediting of NGOs, nobody's going to come out now in their defense. But people understood that this was not about NGOs, it was about freedom. It was about Georgia as a free country or the end of it. Yeah. So there was a reaction. And I do think, as Corneli said, and let's end on a kind of uh, positive note, that there is a change of the generation. This is uh, a generation that was born in freedom, however imperfect. This is a generation that has completely different references, which is very globalized. Um, and, uh, you know, this kind of old style uh, authoritarian habits are very difficult to accept. So unless they all leave, there should be some kind of a change at home. Any other, yeah, well, on that slightly optimistic note, we have um, more optimistic note, shall we say. We have a couple more minutes. Um, any other final couple of words from you, Corneli? Yeah, basically, just to conclude, uh, uh, I think, uh, you know, even though Georgian uh, authorities, they trying to mimic sometimes, you know, like Orban government or Turkish government or some other like authoritarian government, uh, yeah. what uh, what we should realize that uh, uh, Turkey can afford uh, this, whatever you call this multivectoral foreign policy or, uh, you know, that kind of uh, foreign policy because it's a middle power. Or Hungary can do it uh, because they are already member of EU and uh, NATO. But Georgia, who is kind of in limbo, geostrategic limbo, uh, with the authoritarian government, with, without having strong strategic partners, uh, which they actually managed to uh, alienate, I don't think that they will be capable to dictate this uh, their conditions or to blackmail EU or some other international actors. They are not in position to do that. And I think this should be there should be some realization in you that uh, even though the uh, government may try to blackmail them, and this is what is happening time to time, uh, but they should understand that they they should be also very um, how to say smart to outsmart this kind of authoritarian kind of tricks. And I think uh, I I have a realization that you understood this um, uh, this uh, momentum about Georgia, and that's why 
commission actually recommended uh, for Georgia to give this candidate status because they understand that at the end of the day, as I said, you know, like um, in Georgia, maybe, uh, you know, like you can compare it, as I said um, uh, a few months ago, uh, Georgia may be a kind of segment of Eastern Partnership at this moment, but in uh, sh medium term or long term, I think we have to be more optimistic because what we see is a very strong support for European integration, which is uh, I think it will be very decisive. Great. Um, on that note, I think I'm going to close. We've had a great discussion. Thank you um, very, very much, Corneli uh, Corneli Kakacia in Tbilisi. Thank you also, um, Natalie, Natalie Sabanadze. Please do read everyone who's watching Natalie's fantastic paper, um, which is published on our website um, and um, is there um, also on, on the page. Um, and um, Georgia is not going away. Um, its dramas are, if anything, intensifying. So I'm sure we'll be returning to this and other topics um, with both of you. Thank you so much. And thank you all for joining. And from me, uh, it's also goodbye. Thank you, Tom. Thank you.